firstly, Mitzi, thank you so much for joining us for Climate Action Live. Thank you so much for having me. It's always such a pleasure. Mitzi, could you tell us about yourself and your journey, work personal journey to this point? I am a full-time climate justice activist with Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, or YACUP, which is similar to a Fridays for Future in the Philippines. I started out as a science for the people youth activist um, when I was in college. And in 2017, I was able to talk to a Lumad indigenous leader and they were telling us about how they were being harassed and displaced and militarized and killed all for protecting the forests, their ancestral lands and our planet. And ever so simply, he shrugged and chuckled and said, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. And those words just ring true to me every single day. It's, it's that simple. We have no choice but to fight back. We have to join the fight of the people on the front lines, of our environmental defenders, because this is our home and we have no other planet to live on. Thank you for saying those things that you've just said. Fantastic. Okay. Where is the world right now in relation to climate justice? We're seeing that more and more people are starting to join the climate movement. And there's been such big support for youth climate activism, especially from civil society and more and more the global youth movement is becoming more intersectional and collaborating and, and standing in solidarity with other social justice movements. Yet we're seeing how world leaders are still continuously ignoring the calls and pleas and demands of the people most impacted by the climate crisis. They're saying a lot of pledges that are vague and empty and promises that don't mean anything, yet they're still continuing to allow the fossil fuel industry to flourish. They're still investing in the fossil fuel industry. They're still ignoring the calls of uh, marginalized nations and communities and countries for reparations for loss and damage and climate finance, such for adaptation and mitigation. And so we're starting to see how people are really moving forward in terms of climate justice, but our leaders, our so-called leaders who are supposed to be leading and serving the people are lagging. I'm interested, I remember COP in Scotland, in Edinburgh. And then I remember, I think it then went to Egypt, didn't it? Um, what do you think of things like COP? I mean, is that working? I think COP and the UN climate summits are a place for us to accelerate pressure and to get some reforms. But we're also seeing how it's these stages that are sponsored by the fossil fuel industry, where the fossil fuel industry has a larger delegation than other countries even. Of course, they're monopolized and, and directed by the polluters because they're given a space in it. There was a quote that went around, I think at the last COP at Egypt, that was like, if you're trying to solve malaria, you're not going to invite the mosquitoes. So why are we inviting the very ones who are causing the climate crisis to these climate crisis solving conferences. Um, I do still think that we have to participate in it and put pressure during that time because those are the times that the world is paying attention more. Those are the times that we can bring greater awareness about the issue of the climate crisis, which is so such an important step before you can turn anything into action. We need that information and that awareness. And it's during these moments that we can still get some victories, just like with the last COP at Egypt, we have the loss and damage fund, which is a fund that will address the losses and damages that countries like the Philippines have already experienced because of the climate crisis. And that's a victory that was only possible through years and decades of mobilizing and organizing and campaigning from different civil society members. And so it's our duty to still go to these places, but also understand that it's not going to solve climate justice because climate justice is building a world where everyone is safe and that no one is left behind. And spaces like these will never really fully address these issues. Amazing, amazing. A very interesting quote. You want to solve malaria, don't invite the mosquitoes. <laughs> that was a good one. I, I'm sad. I don't remember who said it. Yeah. Well, they were very clever, weren't they? Okay. So... What has humanity got to do, Mitzi, to get through the climate crisis? And do you think we're capable as humans of turning it around? In my mind, it's so simple. Just like the Lumad indigenous leader told me, we have no choice but to fight back. So to get through the climate crisis, 
it's really just as simple as pr prioritizing the needs of the majority over the wants of the few. Prioritizing the well-being of everyone on the planet versus the profit of a few multinational corporations that's causing majority of the climate crisis instead of the fossil fuel industry when clearly the renewable energy systems have already become more sustainable obviously but also more affordable and more accessible and so there's so much potential for us to transition into that climate just world that we're trying to fight for and build and these places, they already exist in some small pockets of resistance. We're seeing in indigenous communities, in small farming communities, that there are, it is possible to live sustainably and enough. And I feel like people have thought that enough is a bad word, but enough is a good word. It means that you have enough, that you have everything that you need to not just survive, but to live and thrive. And how do we do that? I think it is through organizing, mobilizing, and really shutting down the fossil fuel industry, ending fossil fuel finance. And governments are more than capable, especially governments from the global north, are more than capable of doing this already. Even the International Energy Agency has said that we don't need um, and we cannot afford any more new fossil fuel infrastructure if we want to keep within the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit. And so this is something that the science has already proven time and time again. It's only a matter of political will and agency. Brilliant. Okay, could you tell us about the inspiring work that you do in order to resolve the climate crisis? What does your day look like? Um, I guess it's hard to describe because it depends. But as a full-time climate justice activist, most of my day is around organizing. Um, and that looks different in different ways and forms. Sometimes it means going to protests and doing speeches. A lot of times it's meeting with people, going to schools, talking to students, um, talking to marginalized communities on the frontline communities. During times of disaster and extreme weather events, we will um, hold a relief operation drive or donation drive, uh, collect that money and then buy relief um, goods and pack it ourselves and then distribute it to the communities that are impacted, but not just distributing it but also talking to them having a conversation with them learning from them about their experiences about the ways that they've been forced to adapt and how we could actually learn from that um, and how to turn that individual resilience into systemic and structural resilience and then empowering them with climate education that will help them amplify and strengthen their existing campaigns for social justice for basic social services and human rights um, so that's one part. Uh, some parts of my day sometimes will involve reading really boring climate reports and empowering myself with information so that I'm able to communicate with other people. Um, so it really depends on the day. Sometimes it's just a day off and I watch the sunset and I take a walk and try to be with nature and try to reconnect because I think that's really important um, that people understand that activists are normal people and we, we we have fun and we relax and it's important that we do that because the fight that we're fighting is a long one so it needs to be sustainable with our bodies and ourselves as well thank you wonderful if people would like to support you how can they do that if they're from the philippines um, i would invite you to join a movement it doesn't have to be our movement but any collective really um if you're an organization already or already a movement you can join uh yakap because it is an alliance of youth organizations but also of individuals so you can join as an individual or an organization if you're not from the philippines that's still the same answer join the movement join a collective i think the more people become organizers themselves that's so powerful and understanding that everyone has a space in the movement everyone has a place in that and through that if that movement isn't doing it already, you can bring up the idea of international solidarity that looks different per campaign, per situation, per country, per person. Um, but for us, it could be as simple as following our social media accounts at YACA Philippines. And that would mean that whenever we do call for donations, when we call for support with petitions or amplifying certain issues, especially around um, the human rights violations of our environmental defenders, then you guys can amplify that and show solidarity in that sense and bring more attention to it because here in the Philippines, at least, the more attention to it here in the Philippines and globally, the more power that we have also to demand the government to show them that, hey, this is something that people care about and you have to listen to us.
I want to ask you one last little thing. If you had one wish, what would it be? I feel like I've been asked this a lot. Um, I think I would wish for people to feel safe. Safe enough with their situation to see that collective action is the answer and is the way to bring us to safety, um, to join the movement. I understand that being an activist can be difficult and scary no matter what situation you're in, whether it's because it's dangerous in your country or because of your socioeconomic standing or, or um, other factors that may play. So I wish everyone to find a community where they're safe, where they feel that they're building that world that we're fighting for. because. When we're able to experience those small pockets of joy and safety, I think we get a better grasp and idea of what we're fighting for. Because essentially, that's what climate justice is, really. It's that feeling of safety and joy and understanding that we want that feeling for everyone. And so once people have felt it, then it's easier to fight for because you're not going to want to let go of that and you're going to want to have it all the time. Well, thank you, Mitzi. You're an absolute inspiration. I, mean, I love following everything that you do. Just keep up the incredible hard work. You're amazing and good luck. Thank you so much.